Hello and welcome from Buenos Aires, Argentina, to this episode of Crossing Borders with Nathan Lustig, where Nate has conversations with entrepreneurs doing business across borders and the people who support them, with a focus on those that have some connection to Latin America. My name is Josefina Dominguez, and I am an editor for Latin List, a proud sponsor of the Crossing Borders podcast. Sign up for a weekly update on latinlist.com to get a summary of the week's biggest headlines in Latin American tech news. Nate's guest today is Pedro Goes, CEO of InEvent, an all-in-one event management platform for corporations to boost event engagement in attendees and organizers. InEvent is also a Magma company, as Magma partners invested in them in 2019 after they completed the summer 2019 cohort of Y Combinator. They talk about what it was like growing up in Salvador, Brazil, and the lessons Pedro learned from starting different businesses before deciding on an event. They also talk about how Sao Carlos' ecosystem has evolved over time and why Pedro and his partners decided to bootstrap an event during the first four years. Pedro also explains how COVID-19 has affected the events industry and how they've quickly responded to the changing landscape. We hope you enjoy this conversation with Pedro Goes. Hey, Pedro, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being willing to do it. Thank you. Thank you Nathan, for having me here today. Where are you in the world today? So I'm in Atlanta, in Georgia. And that's where we are based. And uh, we have our teams also in New York. <laughs> we still locked down, so they're yeah, going well. And tell me a little bit about InEvent. What do you guys do? So we are an event software platform. And the main thing that we do now is we help our customers migrate uh, online events and really generate revenue from these events. Uh, we believe that the lead uh, strategy for all different companies like lead generation process can be improved. And we believe that using software to improve how many leads are going to close and how customers are going to interact with you can be, uh, can be something that can be a pipeline, a clear pipeline using software. And that's what we do for huge companies. We put these events uh, with them and then they use for either like small meetups or 20, 20 people, 30 people, or huge events for 40,000 people. So give me some examples, like what would be uh, events that you've done that you think are, are interesting examples of how you, you've made processes better for companies? Yeah, so we have a customer, for example, they host this, this financial event and they want to invite all their customers by different segments. And then based on the segment, they get discounts to join the event and then they go to different sessions inside the event. They have meetups, dinners and everything. Uh, and we built this experience for them and then in the end, we know exactly where they are in the process. So we can export, like I know where a different person went and then I can offer them products specific to their portfolio. And then they are able to increase the number of attendants from one year to another by 80%. So the event was so good and a lot of people just loved it. And the re- revenue that they got from the, like people purchasing more of their financial products increased by 80% from one year to another. So that was a really great uh, use case that we had. Awesome. So we'll go deeper into an event in a little bit here, but I wanted to go into your background. Where are you from originally? So I'm originally from Salvador. It's a city in Brazil. Um, it's actually a funny story because I met Vini in Sao Paulo when we were in college, like 20 years, 20 years later. But we are from the same city. Like we were actually were born like two kilometers apart from each other. It's a funny story. And then that's the city where I lived for like the last 10 years, uh, for the first 10 years of my life. Then I went to Sao Paulo. And in Sao Paulo, I had the chance to meet with my co-founders, Vinny and Mauricio, when I was studying at the University of Sao Paulo. And did you always know you were going to be an entrepreneur, or is it something that came up during your, your working career? So I think that I was really inspired by um, the idea of, of providing something, because I come from a, from a country where you see that um, there is a very strong, like our, our, our background is really about, you know, a lot of struggle, you know, like, uh, I think that applies not only to Brazil, but to all Latin American countries. Like, we, we, we had to fight a lot in the last, you know, 100 years to get a lot of things going right for our country, you know, and uh, I just wanted to do something that was going to be able to, to provide that, like, hey, how can I improve my country? How can I do something that's going to make our country proud? And I wanted to do multiple things. So my, my family originally comes from uh, the public service area, um, working at churches and everything all these areas related to that. And when I was in college, I just saw like, oh, there are these great, you know, Brazilian companies that are doing these great things. And 
I just wanted to be like them, like to sell software internationally and, and build this global company. Um, and and then when I was in college, I started working on these small projects, but also thinking like, hey, we can build the next, you know, like Facebook, Google, or or Tesla. Like we could do those things. And on that belief, like I, we started a company, like we tried five or ten different ideas in college, and one of them worked out in the end. Yeah. What were some of the other ideas that you tried out and what did you learn from trying out those ideas? Yeah, that's cool. So the first one was actually an idea for people to order uh, food before they arrive at the restaurant. So it's very similar to the delivery apps that you have today. The difference of ours is that you'll order and still go there and pick it up. The difference is that it will be ready for you when you arrive. So this idea failed <laughs> because we didn't find a lot of customers willing to use the system. Then we had another idea, which was for an app to drink water. We thought that health was going to be a big thing, so we tried to do that, but there is no way to get money going. Then we had another third idea, which was, hey, maybe we can get uh, famous people in Brazil to like send a daily message to their fans, to their fan base, and we can charge like uh, one real per month so they can listen to all their audios. Uh, this also failed because we didn't have contacts in the, um, like we didn't know famous people, basically. Uh, and there were all the smaller ones, like one for, um, people that need uh, with, with help support. And uh, there are a couple of other small ideas that we had, but the main ones were that. And what were the biggest lessons learned from doing all of those different businesses that helped you find the in-event problem that you wanted to solve? Yeah, I think that you need to find, you must have contacts uh, with the right channels that you want to deliver. So it doesn't really matter if you had this great idea for, you know, like I want to reach out, I want to make like this fan database with famous people. Like if you don't know them, like if you don't have contacts in the industry, if you don't know how to deliver the product, it doesn't really matter how great your technology is. Like you really need to be able to be on the right place at the right time and know the right people that can help you get the right channels to deliver your product. Uh, without that, like it doesn't really matter how great technology is for your business. And what was, why did you decide to do, to, to start InEvent rather than any other business uh, that you could have potentially done? So from all these different ideas, like we were really, hey, we need to understand what the market is telling us. Like we need to move according to what the market is telling us. And based on that, from all the ideas that we had, the only one that had traction, by traction I mean money, revenue coming from customers, was the in-event system. So that's where we found uh, our first customers and it was much easier to sell in-event and other ideas at, at where we were, like which was in the countryside of Sao Paulo at the University of Sao Paulo in a city called San Carlos. And so based on that, like we were able to grow the business quickly. So uh, in the first year we were working, but in the, the year number two, already doing 30,000 reais, which for us was really awesome. And we were like two, three, you know, people, three students doing, just doing 30,000. So that was pretty great. And based on that, on that alone, like the traction that we got, the revenue that we got from our customers, then we decided, hey, we can, we can, we can, during a pipeline here. So we can connect with people, we can develop more time to develop the, the software and everything, and we can grow this into a huge company. That's what we thought. What did your friends and family think or tell you when you were trying out all these different ideas and then you decided on one when you were students? Oh yeah, for them it's like, like it's, actually, it's actually funny stuff because every time that I talked to my mom and my father, it was like, Hey mom, I'm doing like our company is growing. Like we now have money to afford an intern or something like that. And she said, "Oh, Pedro, when are you going to?" That's awesome, Pedro. I love you. What are you doing? But when are you going to graduate? Like when you're going to get a diploma? So that was always the, the last question. You know, like when are you going to uh, finish this and go back and and really start working on something that you know you can make a lot of money. So or you can afford to have a stable job. So that was always the. Um, the final, like when I was talking to her, that was always the final question, uh, at least for like 10 or like, even two years ago, we still talked about this all the time. Like, hey, Pedro, are you still, what are you doing? Like, yeah, how, how is your university? Have you done that? <laughs> and everything. And what was the ecosystem like in, at the university? Were there other students trying to build businesses that you talked with or were you guys kind of on your own? So we had a couple of other businesses, but that's not something really common uh, at the time. So today it's much it's like the, the San Carlos is much more developed because of other initiatives around the region. So I think it's today is much more developed because I think there are business cases of successful companies that are going back to San Carlos because that's a good, good place for hiring uh, developers. 
So there are a lot of companies going back to Sao Paulo to hire there. So that's why the region got developed. But at the time, um, we didn't have a lot of uh, entrepreneurs. Like I knew like five people that were actually building business, but they were not part of the university. They were outside of it. But the main thing is that I think the university is a great place to start a business uh, for a couple of things. The first one is that they provided me with all the, the all the things that I needed. So I had a, I, I could meet a lot of people because finding great co-founders is essential to build a long-term business. And I could meet a lot of people um, very like in a very short period of time. <clears throat> and then I had all the resources. So I could uh, have internet. I could have you no know, 100 megabit internet to make calls, to develop software, to connect with other people on video conferencing. I also had the resources to record video because there were different places where I can go and get silent places and I had great background to first create our first videos. Um, and also there was a place where we had uh, an unbelievable amount of really bright people, you know, so it, a lot of people with a lot of energy wanting to do something different. So that was the right place to say, hey, we want to do something crazy. Who is up to do it? And I could find so we actually had I had actually had nine different business partners throughout the beginning of Innovent. Some of them left, and uh, Vinny and Mauricio are the ones that are still today and have become the company with me. Uh, but there are six other people that stayed for like one year, two years, and then left. So when you guys were just getting started, you had gotten to some clients in the thirty thousand rise, which at that point was probably somewhere between eight and fifteen thousand dollars in in yearly revenue, which is nice for for students. What was next? How did you build it over the next couple of years? What was the inflection point where it became, wow, this is a this is a real business that we can we can build and try to go more global? Okay, so the the, the, point, the first point for us was, hey, like we need to get these meetings because for my head, like I was thinking very simply, it was like if I have X amount of meetings, I'm going to convert Y percent of them, and I'm going to get you know Z amount of customers, you know, so. I just created this pipeline and I thought, hey, I need to book like 100 meetings per month so I can get like X amount of revenue in the end of the month. So the first thing that I built was like, hey, who can like cold call people and who can, you know, create content? I actually, at the moment, we didn't have this content strategy. It was more like, hey, which companies can we call today to meet with them and try to sell software? And so we went to this very, like, there was a corner in the university that we went there every day, like before he was already. And we just like, go on Skype or that was what we had at the time. Then we went to Hangouts and we just called people. Like, hey, I need to call you and, and just call the companies and, and see if we can get them to meet. After they met, like if they accepted that we would travel to Sao Paulo because Sao Carlos is not like, it's 250 kilometers from, it's like uh, 200 miles. And so like 160 miles from Sao Paulo, which is the biggest city in Brazil. And they would travel to Sao Paulo because there we have a lot of customers. We have like 12 million people in Sao Paulo uh, and we with these companies. And we did that for two years. And then I gave a moment when we were like, hey, like 30, 30 to 50,000 high is a lot of money. So we said like, let's go full in and uh, we moved to Sao Paulo. And that's when we thought like, that's the only thing that we can do. Like we need to make this work because that's the only option that we had. And after the first year fully working on this project, which was 2015, at the end of the year 2016, we were doing about 120, 120, 130 uh, Brazilian high. So that was pretty good after one year of work. And that's where we, we just kept working on this for every single year after that. And how did, you, how did you organize the business? Did you build a big office somewhere or did you just hire talent wherever you could find it? How, how did you guys think about that? Yeah, we, we had no resources at all. So we were just working from home. Like when I went to Sao Paulo, I usually stay at my uncle's house, I thank him very much for that because after a couple of um, couple of weeks, like that's something that starts to say, hey, they're just coming here every week. So, uh, <laughs> so that was something that like we got a lot of support from our friends and family. Like friends and family, usually people think like they gave us money, but for me, it's much more like they gave me emotional uh, support and they gave me you know somewhere to sleep. So that's already a lot of you know to afford and. So I got that. And even the resources like the computer, like I had the money to buy a MacBook for myself uh, from a couple of years before. But Vini, for example, we had to go to a hackathon. It was this hackathon that we went, um, that we won in 2015. We went to Miami, they invited us. And we went to Miami and we got the award there, which was to $2,500 per person, which was an incredible amount of money. And that was the first time that Vini got his MacBook. It was based on the hackathon that we went there to, it's, we thought like, let's go to a hackathon win this hackathon and use the money to invest in our company. 
So that was something that we did uh, because we had no other resources to, you know, to get even basic, like a computer, you know. And you bootstrapped the company from 2015 until the middle of 2019. Talk about why you didn't go and get investment and then the decision to get investment um, in 2019. Yeah. So we tried, to, like, we were talking with investors locally in Brazil since, like, since 2013, I think. Since every time that we went there to network and, uh, and meet new people, we hey, this is investor. We would say, let's meet with him. We'd say, he wants to invest. And the feedback that we always got was that, like, your idea is not something that is, like, unique and different. Like, people thought, like, you're, you guys are not doing, like, 3D virtual Oculus kind of things. So it's not something that I'm interested in. Like, I just want to have, like, explosive ideas or really innovative, like, Silicon Valley type of things. Or uh, people are like, hey, how much revenue do you have? Do you have, like, $10 million in revenue? And we said, no, we have, like, 200k like it was much less than that and it and the times that we did get someone interested in the product they were like hey i can get you like 100k to get you know 60 percent of the company so we said that that's crazy um so we, we never really got like we knew the potential of the company like we knew how much it was valuable like we thought that could be worth like 100 million eyes or you know 20 to 50 million dollars in a couple of years we're going to sell 50 percent of it today for something that we don't believe in right so it was more like a lack of investment, like the ability to get investment at the right, you know, valuation and at the, with the right uh, support instead of just saying, hi, we don't need like investment it was, I think the market in Brazil is still developing like all Latin America and in the US was like, it's much more developed and was much easier to raise, fundraise than, uh, than Latin America. And how did you decide which, uh, where to try to get money in the US from and, and end up doing what you you ended up doing yeah so uh, that's a cool story so in 2018 we were like we, we always kept the, the website in english uh, that was our something that we had like we thought hey uh, we must keep the source code in english first and then everything else would be uh, we can translate to portuguese and spanish so in 2018 this customer arrives and uh, on our website on the sales chat and they just say hey i'm this i'm this huge customer from silicon valley and I want to meet you guys because I thought that the software that you have for events that that would work well for us. And we felt like that, like we went crazy. Like, do they know that we are where we are and then how, like, they were a small company and everything? And they, and they just engaged with us. Like, we had a couple of Zoom meetings. Like, we didn't know it was Zoom at the time. Like, that was the first time that we were introduced to Zoom. And they have a couple of meetings. Like, we showed our, our software a couple of times and they requested things. We developed them. And then we went to Silicon Valley like two or three times to meet with them, like these huge meetings with like 20 people from the customer side. And the end, after six months, like the business didn't close, like we didn't get the deal. But it was something that really opened our eyes. Like we said, like, man, that, that can really, like, we can really be global. Like that can, we can do something like way beyond Brazil or anything. So we realized that we, need, we needed to invest in this, in this strategy. So in around 2000, in 2018, we decided to move uh, to the U.S., like to really leave there and, uh, and to build the global company. So we started the whole process of applying for visas, uh, to get like a location, to get, you know, like, you know open the company and everything, all these, these small things. And in 2018, 19, we thought, hey, let's get in the business letter to support us. That's going to give us great credibility when growing the US and, um, and help us build this great company. So we applied for a bunch of letters and we got accepted by Y Combinator. Um, which was kind of crazy because we did, we never thought that we will get back to Icon Data like we dreamed about it, but it was not something that we actually managed to like we never really thought that we were going to be accepted. Like we only realized that when we got accepted. Like we was like, no, that's crazy. Like how can they accept us? Like they they, they invest in these huge companies, why they're going to invest in some you know guys from Brazil. And they invested in us and this was awesome and we used that to fundraise and um, network and you know get the first customers going and for me it's like the best experience like i'm really grateful for everything that happened since then and i'm just happy to be able to work with these great companies that we are working right now a lot of latin american companies especially in software as a service want to try to be more international or sell to the u.s market and you guys have been able to maintain both um, latin american clients and also grow globally Talk a little bit about the, that process and some advice that you would give to other LATAM SaaS companies that are maybe want to try to replicate some of the success that you've had. Yeah. I say the first thing like to be really candid is like, 
like you really need to focus on one market like the market for us is it's global it's us to you know worldwide support so i think that the I, I, what i'm saying that is that we, the business in brazil was growing like 80 percent a year and that's not the case anymore today so today the business is still growing but the main business that's growing a lot is in the us right so this focus that we have right now is you really need to focus on something. Like if you just want to say, hey, I want to still grow like the same amount that I'm growing in Latin America and still grow the same amount in the US. I don't I don't know how to do that. What I know how to do is like really focus on one market. If the market that you have is the US, then you can grow there and use that growth to worldwide expansion. Because the 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 challenge that you have when when building a global operation is that you have to redesign most of your systems to be accepted by the new location that you are. So that you are in. So Example, if you're in the US, you need to integrate with the local payment systems, you need to partner with local companies, you need to support the labels and the, the, the language that they use. It's not only speaking English, it's more about, hey, how do they treat, like nobody tells you like, I'm in the US. People tell you I'm, I'm, I'm domestic, you know, and international. They don't use the words global or US versus other countries. It's more like domestic and international. So these are the terms. And you adapting to this, like the labels are going to put, like the, the, the questions that you're going to ask, and the forms that are going to use all of these matters uh, when deploying a global operation. So you really need to have someone that's really senior in the team to be there, to be able to take those decisions and be able to say, really, like we are going, this is our focus, is, is growing this side of the business right now. So even if that's not going to drive revenue right now for us and we have another business that's in like that that's driving revenue right now, we are going to prioritize this because that's where we see ourselves long term. Uh, and if you don't do that, like you always have this thing where Hey, I have the I have the opportunity to still stay in Brazil and still make money there right now, and you're never going to leave, you know, where you are. So you're still going to prioritize always, you know, the operation that you had before. So it must be something really strategic for you. You must say like, I want to grow the U.S. business, and you need to support this with decisions that sometimes will penalize you momentarily on revenue, but in the long term, will make a huge difference for your business. You talked about focusing on the parts of the business that could be bringing money today. And you're in an industry where you have a before coronavirus and after coronavirus. Talk a little bit about how that's affected you and the changes you've made. Yeah, so around February, the Y Combinator demo day from this current batch in winter 2020, they decided that they were not going to have it. It was going to be 100% online. And we thought that the Y, the y Combinator demo day was one of the most incredible events in my life that I had the chance to join. And I said, oh, if they're going to cancel this, first thing, this is really, really a, a virus that's really, it's going to disrupt a lot of things. So that was my first thought around this. So if YC is, is taking this variable, it's because it's really uh, something that we should also take into account. And the first thing was, we need to replicate the same experience that we have only with in-person events at online. Right, so we need to do that because I know that Zoom, it's not the same thing as going to an in-person event. So I shared this, this idea with Mauricio and Vini and we started working on a prototype and we had the, the beta by demo day on Y Combinator. It was pretty good, like people realized there was something different and we got a lot of positive feedback. And then we start, just started working on this all the time. And then the crisis really became this monster that is today. Um, we already had the software for like 30 days because we were working on this before the, the really the big outbreak. Um, so even that, the revenue went down a little bit for the first two or three or four weeks, but then it got back up because we already had the software while everybody else didn't. So I think that so far we are, we are, we are building this just because we thought about something before, but I don't think it was like, hey, like you predicted the future it was more like, hey, we had the chance to do something today where we were thinking it's going to be cool, so let's do it. And that turned out to be something that was meaningful for the company revenue and growth. And how is it, how is it uh, gone? And how are you managing the team from um, Georgia, New York, and Brazil? So we have, um, we have a very, uh, we hired managers. So that's one thing that we were able to afford with the, the capital that we had raised. Um, we were able to hire really good managers, like middle managers between like me and the, and like everybody else. So, uh, we have now a customer success leader, like, uh, a VP of marketing, a VP of inside sales, a VP of sales. So they're able to, you know, run the operations from Brazil and or run the operations. You also have someone that's going to New York and we have someone, they also travel with us everywhere. We go to Europe all the time. 
And so they are able to really run the business locally and really meet with people like on a day-to-day basis. So that's part of the solution. The other solution is really uh, building something that people can work from anywhere. So we embrace remote work uh, since last year when we moved uh, to the US. Uh, and since then we have been able to really hire people that have remote experience. So since that's something they already have experienced, they, they know how to work remotely. And with the virus, the outbreak, like it was not something that they were affected so much because that was a skill that we were already hiring for before the outbreak, before even if it was like considered remote work to be something so essential like it is today. If you could go back to when you first started the business, knowing everything you know today, what advice would you give yourself? So the first thing is, um, I'll, I'll just, uh, like, it's, it's a lot of effort that you have to put in for so many years. And I didn't expect to be like that. For, like, it's, it's a huge amount of effort for a very long amount of time. So you, you, you have to think about this as, hey, I'm going to start this. And that's going to take 10 years to build something great, you know? Uh, and a lot of people are thinking just short term, like, hey, it's going to be something great in six months. I'm going to raise a lot of money. It's going to be really like big. And that may happen. Like, I'm really happy for companies that can do that so quickly. Uh, but I think that a lot of business, they're going really, really long term. Like you see founders, they're really successful in their 40. Uh, and I, I see that how, like when I was 20, I didn't know, but now I'm approaching 30. I really know how, because I didn't know why, because that's when you have all this experience from all these previous business and you have put all this time in uh, that you really know how to deliver this to the ch- different channels that you need to. So it's just about this. Like if you're going to start a business, think that this is going to be something that you're going to do this long term. So really make the decision to think about this. Like if it's something that you really are willing to put all this effort in. Do you have any blogs, books, podcasts, or documentaries you'd like to recommend to people, whether about business or just life in general? Yeah. So I, I like to, uh, I read a couple books like I, I usually like is there is um, Osiris from Embraer is a really inspiring person for me. He built um, it's Embraer. It's 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 crazy for me. Like Embraer, it's one of the fourth largest uh, airplane manufacturers in the world, and they they built this from Brazil. All the other companies are either Europeans, it's like Boeing or Airbus, and the one in Canada, and they're all like first world countries, like really developed. And the fourth one is one from Brazil, and it's real really developed. Like there's twenty billion dollars in revenue every year, so. I'm really inspired by Osiris and what he has been able to build at Embraer. There's also a really good book, Good to Great, by Jim Collins is something that provides real experience on how, how founders have built great companies. And also I read recently The Comcast History. It's a book about a, how to build a business in the last you know, 80 years and build something really huge. And you see the compound effect of how channels can, can help you expand. Even if you don't have like the best product at a given moment, since you have the best channels, you can deliver that to people much more easily than, you know, the cool startup that just arrived and has a better product. What's next for InEvent in 2020? So we are, we just launched the virtual lobby, like the official product. It's something that we're getting a lot of traction. We are hosting huge events. Uh, we're going to have you, Nathan, in our next event. Uh, it's going to be something awesome. We already have like 300 people subscribed to this event. So these are things that we see that there's a lot of demand with the virtual lobby, going online, helping people how to bring their strategy online because they, today they have in-person events. How can they build that uh, online and do this, the same revenue channels and still, and, and still keep business going? So we are building this strategy for them, uh, helping these companies migrate online. And that applies for small companies. So we're getting feedback from small companies and companies that have you know, hundreds of thousands of employees. And if I can help anyhow with these companies who migrate them online, that's what we're doing with the virtual lobby. Awesome. Well, it's going to be fun to watch you continue to execute over the next year or so. And uh, thanks for being willing to do the podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. It was awesome. Yeah. Thanks again for listening to this episode of Crossing Borders with our guest, Pedro Goes. And thank you to Angel Andraca for producing this podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please share with a friend and give us a rating on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. It's the best way to share what's going on in Latin America's ecosystem.